we'll check us. Okay, so uh, in theory, we're now live. Hello, everybody. Um, while Laura, our wonderful uh, uh, community manager, is checking that we're on all the right platforms, I'll say hello. I'm Squirrel. Uh, this is Daniel, and we'll be uh, uh, talking more with Daniel about IT in a minute. Uh, but we'll give people a, a couple moments to arrive. I see a, a couple of folks appearing. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, welcome to those who are watching on a recording. I uh, always like to say hello to them first so they don't feel left out. Uh, we're very glad to have you uh, watching that way. And you can always get in touch with more questions um, if you're not live with us. Um, you know, there's the Squirrel Squadron Forum where you can post questions and ideas and thoughts and, and get my reactions and others. And of course, you can also drop uh, either me or Daniel an email. Uh, Daniel, don't let me forget to um, let you give uh, a little contact info for, for Lifeline. That's something I definitely okay. want, want to do so people can get in touch with you. Uh, Laura, do you want to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Are we, uh, are we on and working? She's giving us a thumbs up. Good. So we must be on. Good stuff. So welcome to everybody who's here. And uh, more people will turn up as we go, I'm sure. Uh, if you're uh, out there uh, watching us and, and enjoying this, uh, uh, what brought you here? Would you mind putting that in the chat? Uh, give us a, a question or the, the topic that was most interesting to you. What made you say, gosh, I, I've got to go on a Thursday afternoon, uh, listen to Squirrel and Daniel. So uh, while you're doing that, I will also mention what is this Squirrel Squadron thing? Uh, so that's my community. It's my way of giving back. Um, and it's a, a group of um, uh, tech and non-tech executives. And uh, we learn together and uh, uh, ex educate each other in events like this uh, on the Squirrel Squadron forum. Uh, there's all kinds of exciting events coming up soon. Uh, we've got next week one on managing your psychology, so uh, dealing with uh, the kind of mad experience you have, especially if you've recently been promoted or changed jobs. Uh, what, what is that like? How do you keep yourself sane? Uh, a couple on increasing cadence, so getting more done more quickly. How do we get more out to our users? Uh, and then a live event in London, so very happy to see people actually in person live for the um, you know, finally, finally able to do that, and we're very grateful about it. So um, uh, that'll be on keeping your technology team bold and trying more things, jumping out of airplanes, who knows, whatever other good stuff they need to do. Someone is looking forward to experiencing the squirrel effect. Okay, fantastic. I can't see who that is, but um, I, if I can produce the squirrel effect, I will, although I'm not sure what that is. Feel free to ask questions as we go, throw them in the chat. Daniel and I will respond. Um, we have noticed there's a bunch of people going to, away for Easter. I had some uh, RSVP no uh, from folks who said they would watch the recording. So uh, if we don't get questions, we'll ask each other questions, which will be fun and uh, we'll get as far as we can. Good stuff. Uh, have I forgotten anything I need to do? No. Um, so I want to tell a story which kind of illustrates what we're talking about today. Why is IT a, a profit center? Why is it something that you can make money from? Why is it valuable? Um, and uh, this will illustrate a couple of the points that I want to bring up, and, and I hope Daniel will either agree or disagree in an interesting and vigorous way. So uh, long ago, I, I was actually a CTO. Right now, I'm a consultant, and I help lots of people, at, uh, 160 companies and counting, with um, all of their technology and IT and non-technology issues. And um, But at that time, I was, I was just hired as a CTO. And the first thing the developers told me was, Squirrel, we're angry. We're going on strike. And I said, what do you mean? Why? Oh, and here's Robbie, who, who knows this story very well. Um, and and uh, um, the, the developers said, this is terrible. We can't believe that we're putting up with this. I said, what are you putting up with? And they said, they make us fix the printer. It's terrible. And I said, well, fixing the printer isn't that bad. It's kind of fun to fix printers. And they said, no, that's not my job. That's not what I do. And I'm not any good at it anyway. And I said, OK, fine. So the first thing we're going to do when I come in is uh, you send all those requests to me. And so I got requests for, I forgot my password, um, my cable isn't working. We had this funny cabling system that was didn't make any sense. And, you know, people would yank their computers and, and suddenly get disconnected. Um, uh, fixing the printer for sure. And for the first month as a CTO, I did all that stuff for an 80 person uh, uh, e-commerce business. And uh, that, that was really valuable because I got to know everybody in the company. I knew what they were doing, where their problems were. I, I really got to understand them. I improved the morale of the developers hugely because they said, look, now we can actually concentrate. We'd like to get this stuff done, not get bugged for IT stuff, which isn't our job. Uh, and I, I didn't think that was uh, a useful use of their time, although I have a very high opinion of IT, as, as they didn't necessarily. Um, and uh, uh, I, I really uh, got a chance to, to understand the company a lot better. Um, and then I found Daniel. 
And um, somebody recommended me to his company, Lifeline IT. And I came along and said, uh, Daniel, can you help? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun fixing the printer, but I'm not very good at it. Can, can you help? And Daniel, would you just say a little bit about uh, what you did then and, and more generally, what does Lifeline do? Um, so it is support. So it's support in fixing printers. It's support in, I guess, three core strands. It's uh, the day to day, what's traditionally called break fix. So if something doesn't work quite the way it should do. We'll fix that broken stuff. Um, the second core part actually is maintenance. So that's actually maintaining a really good environment for developers, for uh, programmers, for all the other people within the business to work within. Um, and then the third part of it is really getting involved with strategy around core IT. So um, where you've been, where you are, where you're going and um, proposing solutions that are going to help you do the, the core things that your business is about. So not trying to turn your business into an IT business, but trying to sort of uh, deliver the environment that you can work in and do the things that you need to do, whether that is in, in the case that you're talking about Squirrel e-commerce or whether it is manufacturing or whether it's professional services. It's about having the environment around it that, that works best. Makes sense. And I saw you do that really, really well for us. And um, you certainly not only broke fix the broken printer much better than I did, but you helped us really substantially improve our uh, our ecosystem and our setup. Um, and it was very, very valuable, which is why I wanted, since you're a member of the squadron, I wanted you to come on and, and talk about this topic. What I, I wanted to start with here is, and we have some great questions coming in the chat, which is super, we'll, we'll definitely get to those, Ashley and Robbie. Um, the, uh, um, the thing I wanted to do is start by defining what I mean by IT. And, and often people who are not in the technology world, who are not running tech businesses and, and aren't a kind of Silicon roundabout, they'll say everything that um, kind of those geeky people do, uh, if it involves sort of Dungeons and Dragons and, and Star Trek and, um, uh, and, and uh, things that you see on the Big Bang Theory, that, that, that's IT to them. And that's not IT for me, so I just want to make sure we define our terms. And Daniel, very welcome to disagree with me. You may have a very different, uh, valuable point of view. What it seems to me, uh, for me, IT is um, all those things that are well known. We've kind of solved them. They involve computers, but we kind of know how they work. And, and that's a huge advantage because um, you can actually read a manual on how it works. Typically, the software developers are trying stuff that hasn't been done before. Nobody has ever built, uh, I don't know, a system for delivering um, uh, teddy bears via drone. And uh, so they have to figure out, you know, how do you balance the teddy bear? Where does it go? How do you um, get the right teddy bear? How do you, um, you know, do machine learning to find uh, how to put it on? But um, if you'd like an email system, we've been running email systems for a long time. And we know how they work. You can look up what to do with them. That doesn't mean that you know how to get a good one, that you know how to find the right one for your business, that you know how to secure it, that you know how to uh, operate and maintain it, that you know how to fix it when it breaks. And so there's tremendous skill and value for me in what the IT function does. It's just different in that um, they, they kind of have, uh, they've kind of conquered the territory. They kind of know what, what's uh, to be done. And therefore, they can get the information much easier than us developers and they can actually do something. So they're usually more productive. They usually get better results and faster because us developers say, oh man, the teddy bears are the wrong weight. Uh, I can't figure this out. Daniel, is that the right definition? Do you see it differently? How does that seem to you? I think I generally agree with you. I'll, I'll caveat it slightly, but I do generally agree with you. It is the stuff that we know. Uh, people know what they're asking for. They know they need email. They know they need um, storage. They know they need all of these things. And it's pointing, as you said, in the right direction. This is the way that you should do storage within your business. This is the way you should do communication within your business. I think where there's maybe more, um, maybe not quite inventing the wheel, but um, innovation perhaps is around the security side of support. Um, and I think that's where it gets really interesting because every security problem that we come across is different to the, to the security problem that we saw yesterday. So I think that side of things, which has been maybe security has been perhaps conflated in with IT support, but I think that's a, one area where it is changing so very rapidly and it is new solutions almost every day. And we just had two events on security and compliance frameworks in the last two weeks. So um, uh, uh, if you're interested in recordings of those, uh, feel free to ask um, uh, and uh, get, get you in touch with, with, um, uh, with those. But um, it, certainly when we were talking about security and I was describing what, what's the absolute minimum that you actually have to know about security and what do you have to worry about? It's, it's, it's stuff that people know, but they're terrible at implementing. Right. And so, um, the, yeah, the, the best security practices are 
in some theoretical sense defined, but uh, what password policy should I have? Uh, how much phishing training should I uh, do? What's the solution for me and, um, uh, and, and what compliance framework should I choose? Um, a lot of those things are where you need really great experts and, and I see IT as the, the people are certainly much more knowledgeable than me uh, about those topics. Um, Daniel, what, what do you do when people come to you and say they have kind of vague security concerns? What, what sorts of uh, analysis do you do? Because uh, I'm curious how, how uh, a, a real professional IT person yeah. approaches that. I think the first thing to do is to uh, benchmark where you are at. And it's, what, it's understanding what are the core systems, where is the data, um, who has access to it. Um, I remember you did a map for us of where yeah. everything was, and I, I've learned about things we never knew we had. Yeah, so it is about understanding where things are, first of all, and sometimes that opens eyes. And um, I guess the, the, the secret with security is it is generally just common sense. It's awareness. It's knowing where things are. And once you know where things are and what they are and who needs to see them, then you can start to build a framework around it. And security is always about layers. And it's that, um, that famous balance between uh, convenience and uh, actually keeping things safe. Uh, we don't want to make it too inconvenient, but at the same time, we do want to keep things reasonably safe. Um, so w it's a number of sort of standard tools around credentials, around two-factor authentication, around encryption, but it's how that fits in with people's day-to-day -day lives because there's no point pu um, putting security in place that people don't want to use. Um, the biggest part of all is awareness. And if you've got really, really good security awareness within an organization and very little else, uh, you're probably ahead of most. Got it. Well, I want to ask you more questions about that. The, the first one is, uh, how do you know what the right things are? Do you ha come in with a checklist and say, this is what we found is our best practices? To, where do you fit on these? Um, do you approach it a different way? How, how do you know which um, security matters actually apply to my um, teddy bear drone business? So strangely enough, a checklist is the last thing we do. The first thing we do is a blank piece of paper. So I will always, as you probably saw, school, map things out on a blank piece of paper, first of all, um, because with checklists, I find you miss things. With a blank piece of paper, you're capturing everything all together and then working it from there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're applying what tools you need to. I say checklist is the last thing because um, there is normally some sort of audit or some sort of final check or um, accreditation. Perhaps it's something like Cyber Essentials, which is a nice uh, bar that most organizations should be able to achieve. Um, and the last thing might be that checklist where we say, okay, you know what, we think we're doing the right thing. Now let's apply the checklist to it and actually audit some of the actions that we're taking. Um, and perhaps we get a certificate at the end of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting that in the chat because some folks may not know that's uh, a, a UK IT certification uh, uh, method. Um, it's called Cyber Essentials. Uh, if I can get it up here, I can show it on the screen as well. Um, so if you're curious about that, if your business is um, uh, not really sure what to do with security, Cyber Essentials would be a great place to start. And uh, we do have a group in the community, a company in the community who's been a client of mine called Cyber Smart that does uh, um, uh, specifically cyber essentials um, compliance. So there are lots of folks who can help you. And of course, uh, Daniel and, and any other outsourced IT person or someone you hire uh, could point you in the right direction for, for you. Um, but I thought uh, folks outside the UK might not know that. Be really interesting if anybody in the chat happens to know what's the equivalent in the US or in Germany or someplace else. I know we have people from various locations. Um, be happy to, to hear about that. Or if you're watching the recording, let me know because I actually realized I don't know what the equivalent is elsewhere. Do you, Daniel? Do you know any others outside the UK? No, I mean, there's various international standards and there's various different sort of uh, Sarbanes Oxley and various different standards that exist globally. Crazy for, stuff, for, yeah. Yeah. That's um, very heavyweight. Cyber Essentials is really nice and easy and light and it's achievable uh, literally in a sort of a sole trader type business and equally applicable up to uh, maybe a business with a few hundred people. Yep. But what you would do is start not with uh, trying to say, do you match all these things? Because it's, it's really a big, that's what Cyber Essentials no, is, a big checklist. Not at all. You would start by understanding what the, how the business works, what yeah. it, what its needs are, where what is what is where, um, and then going through the checklist because then Absolutely. you'll have some understanding. Of and in fact, we would on. normally work with another company like your friends that you mentioned earlier to, yep. um, to actually do that final uh, external audit certification. Got it. Okay, makes sense. Well, that would be really helpful. But you said another thing in there, and I, I'm hoping I can remember it. Um, it was about sort of creating value and finding ways to to improve. Um, and that if if uh, and uh, it was actually broader than security, and I wanted to go there because yeah, I just so, think it's so valuable. 
that it's that third piece so uh, alongside the um break fix and the maintenance it is the it yep. strategy so it's about regularly routinely looking at sort of where you've been where you are and what's coming up mm -hmm. uh and again we as an it support organization we've got quite a breadth of uh engineers quite a breadth of knowledge but also quite a breadth of clients and different environments that we're working with so we're constantly exposed to new ways of doing things whether that is a software solution or a security solution um, or a hardware solution we can say actually you know what have you thought about doing this maybe this is the way you need to be taking your organization over the next sort of six 12 months um, here's some goals here's some strategy for you um, and that for me is can very you think much of an around... example what's a, what's something that you've done recently like well, that because I, I think it an might example be as... really help People yeah, like so it. it might be as simple as migrating uh, a backup system from something which is uh, heavily on-premise focused to a cloud-based backup system. Yeah, would um, you like to close your server room? How about how about if there were no computers yeah. in there? Yeah, how, how would uh, I do that? You, Boy, that would be nice. They 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 hum, <laughs> they bug us. Yeah. And it, we see a lot of that. I mean, we're far from a hundred percent cloud with all of our clients. No. Um, but when we first started, just over twenty years ago, um, there was no cloud whatsoever. Oh. Um, we had on-premise servers, and over the years, we've gradually seen a drift towards um, data centers and co-location, and now a gradual shift towards cloud. And most clients are in some sort of hybrid between them. So perhaps the best example is how we manage and how we predict over the next few years, um, how we move our clients' uh, IT infrastructure environment to the most efficient and most effective base for them. Yep. And when you're describing that to somebody in the business, I know you've done it with me, the kind of thing I think you would say is, um, so so that's that's costing you hassle. It's, it's costing you my and engineer's time uh, here at Lifeline. We're, we're having to come and fix things in the cabinets. And that doesn't seem like a good use of your money. And also, um, it's costing you in reliability because um, you're maintaining this stuff. It's ancient. Um, it's a lot of hassle for you, and it could be sort of automatically updated for you in the cloud. So you're making a case both for a cost saving, and, and I think this is crucial. This is what people miss so often, uh, an opportunity actually to make more profit, to be more efficient, to, um, uh, to, to get better results, maybe even more revenue, because um, suddenly you'll be able to run your phone system and, and have more uh, salespeople making calls. It could be that you uh, improve the, um, uh, the throughput of your website because it's uh, parts of the database are no longer hosted on, in, a, in a data center. Whatever it might be, I think you're going to pitch that in in business terms, and people are going to be thinking about the return on investment and their IT, which I think most people are not. Is, is that how Agreed. you do it? Do you no, do it absolutely right. I mean, it's um, you, it's like any other asset. You need to work out how that asset is working and how it's going to uh, be most efficient for you. Um, sometimes it's got to be scalable. Sometimes it's unpredictable. Uh, sometimes uh, you might know exactly what you're doing, but either way, you've got to be able to say, look, here are the options that are available to you. Here's how to get your investment working in the right way. So if you don't remember um, anything else from this, I, let me just get this in just so I don't forget. It. If you guys don't remember anything else from this, remember you should be asking your IT folks, whether they're outsourced like Daniel or in-house, uh, and it's the people who are fixing the printer, the people who are doing the stuff that you think you kind of already know. How could I get a return on investment on what you're doing? You're not just a cost center. Go right. ahead, Daniel, sorry. No, that, that's exactly it. And it, it's, um, it is an expensive part or a large part of um, a client's uh, budget or a company's budget. Um, not just the day to day that you're spending to support this stuff, but also if there is a capital inve investment, the capital investment you're making into it um, and how that does actually serve the business. Got it. I think for us, because we're outsourced, we have to demonstrate value all of the time. Yeah, um, because but it's so very often, clear what we're costing to a business. So often, I'm sure, and certainly that's the way I thought about it when I first brought you in. I thought, oh, this is costing me a certain amount of time. There's a certain amount of cost here, and we're going to move that cost over here. We'll know what it is because um, you did this great thing where you you uh, make it a fixed cost, which is, is really really helpful. Um, uh, so I'll know what the cost is. It won't be on me anymore. I won't have to do it. My developers won't have to do it. This cost will be controlled. And that's great. That was your first two points. But I think the third one is the point of this live stream, that there are various ways, and we're going to talk about a couple more, in which you can actually increase your profit. You can increase your revenues. You can get uh, a better business result. And it's not just moving a cost from one place to another or making it easier to manage. Um, I just think that's uh, so vital. And we've talked about security as one uh, element of that. Uh, let's talk about another. We've got. Uh, 
um, uh, sorry, I'm not seeing who this is. So I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you're wanting to be anonymous. That's fine. But you're your LinkedIn user and you've written so much that I have to sit up in my chair. So that's fine. I don't mind. But uh, let's see what this is. Uh, when a firm, e.g. a late stage startup, I have the feeling this person might be at a late stage startup. That would be great. Has developed its own platform and tools and has now decided to license Salesforce and is doing a costly customization. What should the role of IT be in requirements setting, supplier selection, execution of the project, future maintenance, and support? Wow. Okay. That's very detailed. And I'm getting tired of sitting this tall. So I'm, I'm going to uh, take that off the screen. But uh, I hope that uh, made sense in the fantastic question. So I, I have the feeling this person might be in that situation. <laughs> oh, it's Dominic. Hi, Dominic. Very good to hear from you. Um, so um, Dominic is asking uh, about probably one of uh, the companies he's working with, I'm guessing. And um, uh, so you, you've developed your own stuff. You've licensed something that's off the shelf. One of these things that we're supposed to understand. Salesforce has been around for what, 10, 12 years. We should know everything about it. But suddenly you're trying to make those go together. Um, my answer to Dominic's question would be, uh, I'd, I'd like the IT folks to be really looking after Salesforce. I, I wouldn't want them trying to look after the custom code that you might have written in C or Python or, or whatever that's, that's owned by the company. That's not going to have this kind of um, well-known characteristic to it. But I could imagine them doing um, uh, all of the things that you list for the Salesforce side of that uh, uh, customization, all the customization of Salesforce to talk to the platform. And, and anything that has to happen in the platform, I would expect the, the in-house team to do. Uh, Daniel, how do you see it? Um, yes, I agree with what you've said. I would add to that, it is that process of managing starters and leavers as well. So when somebody comes, what needs to be done to set them up on those systems? Exactly. Is, does there need to be some sort of induction for people? Um, it's it's a real challenge. And um, just to, to go back, I think there was a mention in there of um, things like supplier selection yes. um, and execution. It's about looking for experience. Uh, it's about looking for, okay, how what resources do you have in-house? What project management resources do you have in-house to be able to manage that process? Um, what IT tasks are involved in that, in that process? A big part of it might be data migration. So you're back to where does that data sit? Where is it going to sit? How do we transform that appropriately? And these are things which are often day-to-day -day bread and butter things for an IT support organization. Um, so um, not just Life IT, but plenty of IT support companies out there will have done this many, many times over. So we'll know the pitfalls, we'll know the, uh, the routes through it. Um, yeah. and, and for example, for Salesforce specifically, I don't know how much of it you do, Daniel, but um, you, you, you might be able to do the Salesforce, or if it's very custom, you would be able to bring in experts, or Dan, Dominic might go and look for his own experts, but you'd look for someone with those particular skills in Salesforce. And uh, that's yeah, again, absolutely. an IT type function, i.e. it's a thing people know, it's a thing that is, um, uh, you can you can look up the best practices, but actually applying them is the hard part. And that's where you need the experience. So I'd want yeah. someone who has done a lot with Salesforce and not just uh, sort of licensed it and um, uh, followed the instructions to install it and then said, now what do we do? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's an interesting subject because we we're actually a Salesforce user internally and did move to Salesforce quite a lot of years ago from our own platform or on our own tools. The so roller coaster um, of Salesforce, boy, that's been been quite a ride, I bet. Yeah, so we're uh, very well into Salesforce and have been for quite some time. But again, in terms of an IT support environment, we wouldn't support the custom code that's produced within Salesforce. There are specialists who would do that, or it would be done normally in house. But it is it's the routine stuff. It's the starters. It's the levers. It's the things that no one really wants to do, and it's important importantly, maintaining um, who is in there, what rights do they have, are the right people in there? Yep. And the, the crucial thing I'd say here is, as uh, Dominic says, there, there's a costly customization going on here. There's something customized in the platform and something customized in Salesforce. That's got a revenue implication. I assume that this late stage startup is doing something, tracking their sales or something else in Salesforce, and they want to connect that to their actual platform. Very normal thing to do. Um, but if you screw that up, that's going to have a huge impact, not just on kind of the ease of adding people to the system, which is a cost end, uh, but also in the revenue that you're that you're driving. So that's the thing. I, uh, the last thing I'd say to Dominic is um, uh, make sure you're doing that return on investment calculation. And it often will turn out that it's better to spend more on, say, a specialist Salesforce uh, 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 organization, someone who has been doing it for, for a long time, um, rather than trying to make do and saying, well, I'm just reducing cost. I mean, how can I get the cheapest people? Maybe there's somebody in Remotistan who, who knows how to spell Salesforce and can download it, and they'll figure it out for me. It'll be really cheap. 
it's not cheap because it winds up uh, that you, you don't have the expertise and you can't get the revenue benefits that you're looking for. And not to mention the, the uh, efficiencies won't be there. So uh, I have a strong bias in, in favor of um, uh, doing the calculation. And if it comes out right enough, it does spending more. So I hope that's uh, helpful to Dominic. It was a fantastic question. And it brings me to, to one of my other thoughts about uh, a fantastic way to, to make tons of money from IT. Um, and that is uh, this increasing um, dominance and increasing uh, uh, trend toward uh, no code or low code tools. And there's so many of them. Salesforce being one of the first actually, um, where um, and uh, another original one that people will know very well, uh, especially if you have any FinTech background or know anybody in, in the city uh, is Excel. Uh, so traders would go into Excel and create fantastically complicated systems with, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, column XXQ1 uh, uh, and row 25,467,000. I don't know what crazy stuff they were doing and insane macros and so on. And it would do all the trading for them. It's, ah, great. There's a penny I can make uh, on every share of this thing by trading it in this complicated way and, and make tons and tons of money from Excel. They aren't coders. They're using things that are well known. You can look up all the documentation for Excel. People have been using it for 30 years or something. And so that those kind of low code tools have been around for a long time and been very valuable. We're now getting more and more and more of them that are allowing people to build whole complicated systems that have, have a very um, uh, um, rich behavior. Um, and uh, I have a fantastic example of one of those that I'd just like to, to share with everybody, uh, maybe as a bit of an inspiration for what you might be able to do. What could you get? more out of this kind of IT side of the business. I had a client um, come to me and they said, Squirrel, we've built this system. They were an early stage startup, so, so uh, a little earlier than Dominic's example. And they said, we built this incredible thing and we don't know what to call it. Um, but the strange thing is we've never hired any developers and, and we don't know what our thing is, but um, it seems to work, although it's weird. And what they had done was they'd taken um, things like uh, Airtable and Zapier and uh, a number of other tools, and they had hooked them all together in this kind of insane Heath Robinson um, uh, kind of system where the, the cat would run along and, and push the mouse to knock over the, the uh, bell and something else would happen. And, and when it all got finished, uh, their customers had automated emails. They had um, a whole drip feed system for, for prospects. They had um, management uh, uh, updates and things going into queues for people to do and so on. So that they really had built an entire mechanism. They, they were an offline business um, providing an offline service. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of obfuscating what they did, but um, there was an offline business in the real world, which had a huge amount of workflow, huge amount of interaction with customers. And they built this entire thing. And they said, Squirrel, what do we call this? We're trying to go to investors. And, and we think it's wonderful, but nobody understands what we've built because they all ask, where's your database? What are your coders? You know, What language have you used? And we say, uh, we don't know. And that kind of ends the conversation. So I finally told them that they, they should market it and they should put on their slides that it was a serverless application. And for those of you who've heard that buzzword, you might know that there's this movement toward, um, in software terms and not in the IT world, toward um, having um, uh, 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 no servers and, and somehow the, the cloud manages the server for you. And that's a nifty buzzword. That sounded good. Uh, they raised their Series A and they're doing very, very well as far as I know. And they've actually hired some coders who are now replacing uh, the, the no code, low code systems that they've got. Um, I have another client uh, I just worked with uh, a few months ago who uh, uh, did a very similar thing recently um, and were wondering what should we do with our developers? And my advice was um, maybe you don't need them. <laughs> it's not absolutely clear that um, the people who are writing software for you are adding value here because you're actually getting so much from the low code systems that and they were hooked together in just this strange, uh, same kind of um, uh, same kind of way. It doesn't scale. So eventually you're probably going to need some developers. But um, there's just tremendous value and people people leave it on the side. They think, oh, well, what I need is some uh, person uh, with a, a, a Star Wars shirt on who, who can sit here 24 hours a day writing code. Y you don't actually need that. Often your own business people can produce a lot of what they need. These guys never hired um, anyone. They, they use their operations person to, to, to get this stuff done. Um, and he didn't have a line of coding experience or anything. Uh, he just was clever and understood the business really well and knew how to hook things together. Daniel, I don't know if you've seen any of this or any of your clients or are you doing any of this um, no code, low code stuff? Yeah, more of it. Um, and it's some, it's often about joining tools together in an efficient way and often led by non-technical people. And it is, as you said, it's using tools like Zapier, it's using tools like uh, If This Then That, which is a similar sort of uh, tool. And one thing triggers another thing, triggers another thing. Um, I think 
the risk with that, and I'm going slightly off your point, so feel free to redirect good. me. But the risk Argue with me. That we good. come across as IT people with this is that quite often it only exists in one or two people's heads. Yes. Um, and then trying to actually build some resilience into something like that, which is intrinsically great, is where the challenges arise. And so perhaps um, the cat got distracted what, by some milk, so it kind of ran off the shelf yeah, and isn't running toward it. the mouse so, anymore. And you say, what's what's happening here? Uh, and, and, then, well, and, and no, nobody knows which air table say, column it is. Yeah. Or they turn around and say, we had a cat. And it's that sort of thing. So <laughs> actually, by we forgot to pay for the, the, the uh, Zapier license. What's Zapier? Yeah. So it's documenting some of these processes and the dependencies, um, which is uh, a, an early thing to do and really helps out. Yep. And really uh, certainly in both the cases I just described, they were very poorly documented. And that's that's one of the errors that people make with no code and no code. You just given me an idea we should we should do a um, uh, we should do a live stream on on just on no code and no code and what the best practices are. Uh, I will yeah. try to remember that. Maybe Laura will remind me. Good stuff. Um, so we also have a uh, topic from our friend Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Very nice to see you again. Uh, Ashley says, I've been trying to figure out what IT covers and what's expected in a distributed business as we scale. So that's, of course, one place where IT is really shone, right, is everybody has suddenly figured out we can be sat at home, as both Daniel and I are and um, running very successful businesses. So um, being distributed is one of the things we all suddenly have gotten good at, and we all had to become Zoom administrators. Um, but also, uh, we, I think we've covered some of this, but I think we can say more for Ashley. Um, what else do we, do we need to do, not only for a distributed business, but for any business? How, how do we define um, what's expected of IT? I think that's a, a good angle on it. What do you think, Daniel? Um, I, I think that, uh, first of all, excellent, excellent question. Um, uh, I, I think we probably still haven't quite figured out what IT covers because it changes so frequently. Um, I think, again, it is different from every business. I always start with the people. So who are the people and what do they need? Um, starters and leavers policies, um, what do they need to do their job? How do we effectively deliver that? And how do we make sure it works every day when they turn it on? Um, so it, it, it's working in that way. A distributed businesses can't be supported in the same way as uh, a traditional office in one building can be supported. Um, and for really practical reasons, just like the hours that people might work, um, it used to be that probably 95% of our clients would turn up at nine in the morning or thereabout and leave at 5.30 in the evening or thereabouts. But now we've got uh, clients who have got uh, people working for them literally across the globe. So hours are different, requirements are different, connectivity is different, languages are different. Um, but what we should fundamentally be doing is getting the right people, getting people set up so that on their first day of work, they're happy, they're comfortable. It's always difficult when you first arrive. Um, you, there's this, I always call it the village idiot syndrome when you turn up and you're a great person, but you haven't got a clue what you're doing when you first walk through the door of a new, of a new company. Um, it's really scary, but it's making, making some of those things really easy, having a good set up ready waiting for you having someone that's on the end of the phone who can answer any questions that you've got on those simple things like literally being able to log in um and i think that's a big part of what it covers and then behind the scenes making sure it's secure making sure there's decent policies in place around um i guess a little bit of it governance patch management maintenance all of those things that keep things ticking along in the background um, one of the other challenges particularly with distributed businesses um is the, I guess, contract management on things like licensing. So uh, understanding what licenses you have and to Squirrel's earlier point around making sure that you're getting a return on investment. Have you got the right licenses for the right people and are they using them in the right way? Um, with are you a lot for licenses of... you're not using? That's uh, yeah. very common. I imagine you find that in every business. Every single time, yeah. So making sure that things like that are in place properly. And it can be much more difficult to manage that with a distributed business because you're looking at software assets as well as hardware assets. Yep. Um, and, and people bring their own devices these days and you have no idea what's installed on them and you have to keep them secure anyway. So these yep. are all um, massive challenges. Uh, I want to look at the other part of what Ashley asked, which is is what's expected of IT. What 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 requirements do you put on them? What where, what are they accountable for? And, and my favorites there are absolutely the kind of um, uh, quality of life issues that Daniel's describing. I think those are extremely important, um, and and they kind of go to the cost side. But the one that people often often miss is that I want IT to be responsible for, to be accountable for um, increased uh, revenue, profit, um, efficiency. Uh, I want outcomes that matter to customers of the business. 
and it may be that they're quite indirect. It may be that um, you know your uh, the IT function is um, pr providing the capacity for us to expand into new countries, and in those countries we can get salespeople and customer service and uh, developers that wouldn't be available at home or skills that we don't have at home. And that's an indirect effect. That's not suggesting that the IT person is themselves creating the new data models or um, picking up the phone and, and uh, earning more uh, from, from sales commissions. But what the IT function is doing there is directly, um, is, is there's a straight line from what you're doing to um, uh, bottom line for the company. And, and that's just so often forgotten. Yeah, just so, to add on to that, yeah. the efficiency is absolutely key. Um, the IT function should absolutely be driving efficiency within the business, allowing people mm -hmm. to do what they need to do effectively and quickly. And, and the, I think the other great thing that I noticed that you do really well, Daniel, and, and um, the best IT people I've worked with uh, across the board have done, is to make contributions that are outside IT. In other words, they'll come along and they'll say, you know, the customer service people were replacing their phone system and that's really going to help them. Uh, but their queues are huge. Why do they have such long queues? Do we have too few people? Do they not have enough good training in how to answer the phone quickly and get off the phone quickly? Um, do we have uh, poor quality in our software, and whatever we're selling um, that's causing people to phone more? But why are these queues so long? And um, I think that's the other thing that's crucial to uh, have IT responsible for is we're expecting you because you're in all parts of the business, you're looking at so many different things. We're expecting you to bring us new ideas to um, uh, make suggestions that are outside your remit. And um, this really blows the minds of IT people that work for me often. <laughs> so tell them, you, you need to go figure out what's happening in, um, uh, in sales. And they're like, Sales, I don't sell anything. You don't want me selling. I have a terrible phone voice. I said, no, I don't want you to sell. I want you to work out what, from what all their all the things they're asking you to do, what they need. For example, if they have a terrible time remembering their login to Salesforce and they can't find the users, maybe we need an automated system that when they use the customer phones, it automatically pops up on their screen. They don't have to log into anything. And they won't know that exists. Well, of course I know that exists. I'm in IT. I know all about that. Yeah, you need to go tell them. You, you're right. You can't uh, help but have, I guess, siloed information and borders between departments in organisations. And IT is one that crosses all of that. And um, we have we're very lucky that we have the opportunity to get to know everyone everywhere and often will know people that people in other departments don't know. So bringing all that together and getting to know what people are doing is all part of working out the strategy and the OK, you know what, you could be doing things in this way or Thanks. you're duplicating a huge amount of data between here and here let's work out how we can make that more efficient let's work out how we can combine that and let's work out how we can make that resource that you've built up that's great available to other departments within the organization and and, and just to say what the opposite is so if you're if you're failing at your accountability what you're doing is just what people ask you to do oh yeah the customer service people need even more capacity on their phone so let's give them loads and loads of capacity so they yeah. can have longer queues that's a bad result we don't want that yeah. So um, the, actually, I hope that's helpful in describing not only what IT covers, which we've talked about a lot today, but also what, what I think they should be responsible for. And I, I think Daniel's mostly agreeing with me. Um, so uh, Dominic has another one, which is fantastic. Uh, he has a new name now. Now he's I Magician. Dominic, you're, you've uh, mastered uh, LinkedIn, obviously. No, now you're on YouTube. I don't know how you're doing this. I'm very <laughs> impressed. But uh, Dominic, the uh, the peripatetic person, says a uh, thousand staff with diverse mobile devices, iOS, Android, laptops, tablets, phones, some company owned, some employee owned, um, and, and uh, oh, uh, bears and, and, and chickens and oh my. Um, how do you make this wild world secure and controlled? I think that's uh, perfectly set up for, for Daniel. I'll, I'll have yep. I'll get my view, but you're doing this all day, every day, aren't you? We are. Um, so number one is to understand actually what you've got. Um, and um, it, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. But I reckon in almost every case, actually, organizations don't know what they've got. They don't know how many staff they've got. They don't know what they're using. They don't know why they're using it. So by understanding what you've got, uh, unfortunately, locking it down and then opening the doors that you need to. Um, but that is the best approach. There's some really good tools out there for mobile device management, mobile application management. Um, and it is a lot easier to do it now than it was even two or three years ago. Um, so again, we will try and use standard tools that fit within the environment that we're working. Um, for example, if we're in a Microsoft 365 dominated uh, organization, we would probably choose Microsoft's Intune as the basis for mobile device management, mobile asset management. Um, there's um, 
but we'll try and use the tools, the standard tools that exist. Things have moved on a lot from the days of BlackBerry. And if, if you remember Good, which was an original, mobile, probably one of the early mobile device management uh, applications out there, um, it is easier to do. But fundamentally, it's first of all understanding what you have and then unfortunately locking things down, creating a little bit of inconvenience, but a lot of security. Indeed. And I'll just add to that. I absolutely agreed. I think the tools are are vital. Uh, I think if we if we've picked up a theme that I didn't expect here, it's start with a blank piece of paper, understand what's happening in the business. Um, that yeah. that that clarity can just be so helpful, and the tools are there to really help you do that. So you, you don't have to draw it on the paper yourself, which I think you might have done back in the day, Daniel. I don't remember, but I remember you sat in our office. Help, Occasionally, I still do. I'm sure you do. Um, but uh, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, the uh, not, not only the awareness, uh, as Daniel said before, but, but also the active involvement of the people in the organization um, in uh, discovering uh, what, what's happening with all those crazy devices. So um, uh, what are they doing? Why are you doing it? Um, that communication element is vital. And I guess I'll add that to, to Ashley's list of things that IT is also responsible for. High degrees of very uh, clear non-technical communication, a high skill in that area it is tremendously important. And uh, when you can enlist everybody uh, to be on, on your side in managing these things, rather than thinking, oh, here comes IT, they're, they're here to lock down my device, let's hide it, let's keep it, keep it from them. Um, if, if you have someone who can explain the business value uh, and the value to the individual of having someone who, for example, will uh, make sure that uh, their device isn't hacked or um, their password isn't compromised or their, um, uh, can actually help them reset their login when they forget it at home uh, and they have an important call in five minutes, um, rather than them having to scramble around and find the post-it note that their dog ate. Um, when you can explain it in that kind of um, uh, vigorous and exciting and, and um, uh, engrossing way, then you'll get uh, everybody in the business on your side. And, yeah. and that's the last thing that I wanted to mention is, is the morale that you can improve with a very good IT system. And I just saw that happen at, um, at the e-commerce company I mentioned is suddenly instead of like a, a doer, um, a grumpy uh, developer or me cheerful but incompetent trying to fix the printer, there was someone who, who was both cheerful and capable and would suggest new ways of doing things. Um, and, and that was what Daniel provided for us and what your IT could do as well. Improving the morale of your team as intangible, but hugely beneficial. And uh, I've seen that over and over again when you professionalize with some of these characteristics we've described. Go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. No, I was going to say it is about um, winning people over and we're here to help. It's your phone, but we'll help you keep it updated. We'll help you show you how to back it up. And what we've done with some particular organizations, very, very brief, um, we'll actually set up almost a market stall, stick a few engineers behind it and say, bring all of your stuff to us. I don't care if it's a PlayStation or if it's an iPhone or if it's your home computer and we'll help your you kids with Nintendo Switch, yeah, whatever it is. And we've yeah. had them all bought up and you fix it. And that's how you win people over and actually realize that IT is there to benefit them and in turn it makes such a difference to the organization fantastic well that i think is is one of the best ideas i've heard in a while um and definitely going to recommend that to, to folks that i meet who are in this situation sorry i have to plug in my computer uh, an it problem my uh when I move over to stream, I don't always remember to plug it in. Um, but uh, the, the idea of um, having some kind of bring bring your device for help, no matter what it is, is just a fantastic way of, of getting people on board, seeing the IT folks as their friends and, and helpers, and um, really helping, for example, in Dominic's situation where you have a thousand people probably frustrated, um, uh, where in um, uh, Ashley's situation where he's saying, what, what are we going to expect of them? Well, you're going to expect things like um, uh, getting everybody on board with uh, an exciting, involving activity um, that humanizes the IT department. What a great idea. Really cool stuff. Daniel, would you like to just say a brief word? How would people get in touch with you if they wanted to talk to you yeah. about uh, Lifeline? Absolutely. Or any um, of these questions? Easiest way is probably by email. Um, I can't actually type into the chat, but my email no, I can. address, Go ahead. if you can do that, Squirrel, is daniel at Lifeline IT. That's L I F E L I N E I T dot net. And I'll get that um, up on the screen. And I assume that yeah. the uh, website also is. Uh, and the um, Lifeline website is lifelineit.net. Lifeline lifelineit.net. Lifeline Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, feel um, free to get in touch there. I'm always on my email. That comes directly through to me. Um, very happy to answer any queries, questions uh, that come my way. 
Excellent. And uh, if you're interested in more events like this, then you can find them. They're always free. This is my way of giving back. This isn't something that, uh, you know, I'm not going to upsell you or tell you, uh, come come use me. You can talk to me about my consulting, but that's not what this is for. This is for sharing information with my community, getting more people involved and getting more tech and non-tech people talking together. So if you're interested in events or the forum or just getting in touch with me, squirrelsquadron.com is the place to do that. Fantastic. Uh, I think we're out of questions. We have a couple uh, happy comments. Uh, Dominic says, love that. And I definitely agree. Uh, so Daniel, uh, thank you so much for being on. And thanks. So well, thank you very for... much for having me. I really appreciate okay. it. And thanks to all of you guys for participating. Uh, come again next week is uh, Managing Your Psychology. Uh, sign up for more exciting events. Next live stream is um, uh, 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 Cadence Going Faster. How do we uh, deliver more quickly? So love to see you at any of those always Thursdays at 4.30 UK time. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Daniel. Thank you.